Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Dorothy here from the CCMA. And as always, you're welcome to our Friday Ask the Expert session. Uh, delighted this morning that we have Owen Thomas McDermott from the Communications Clinic. Uh, a lot of you will know Owen because he is normally our Master of Ceremonies for our annual conference, which we were just talking about before we went live because it was actually due to take place next Wednesday in the Killish Sea here in Kildare. So obviously really disappointed that we haven't been able to go ahead with that. But I think we have a great opportunity this morning to, to learn from Owen and his expertise in the whole area of communications. Uh, and there's been a huge level of interest in this particular webinar because I know all of us are struggling with communication, presenting, uh, being effective as we get used to, or more than used to now, the technology of, of webinars and team meetings uh, online and Zoom, etc. So I know Owen is going to share his valuable expertise in this area. So. Thanks so much. I'm going to give everybody another minute to log in. Great to see you. Hi, Michelle. Long time no see. I think the last time I saw you was in Heathrow Airport, so uh, good to see you again online. Um, so please do let me know that you can hear and see okay. And as always, if you have any questions, um, just put them in the little book chat box to the right. We already have a couple of questions in advance that people have submitted, which is great. Uh, and I'll put them to Owen as, as he goes through his, his presentation this morning. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Owen. Owen, thank you as always. Uh, really looking forward to this. I think we'll all learn something this morning. So uh, I'll hand over and let you take it away from here. Thanks, Owen. Thanks very much, Dorothy. And thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you. I was thinking yeah, that next week I always had the easy job of listening to others give interesting insights and valuable information. And every year at the CCA, CCMA conference, I would gather all of the insights that I would hear from the brilliant speakers and then spew that information out over the year to make it appear like my own insight. So I, I'm devoid of that interesting content that I would have, would have lapped up every year. So hopefully we'll get a chance to meet up again and hear about what's going on in the industry and what's the best way of supporting our customers and clients. As Dorothy said, uh, I'm Owen McDermott, the Managing Director of the Communications Clinic, and on a daily basis, myself and my colleagues help people and organizations communicate better, whether that's one-to-one, one-to-few, one-to-many, in the room face-to-face, -face, while working on a remote site, or working from home, or working with organizations about their internal communication strategies and also their external communication strategies. Now, across all of those different interactions, the principles of effective communication remain the same. Who are you talking to or who you're writing to? What do they think and feel and do and saying knowing before they receive the information? What do you want them to think and feel and do and saying knowing after they receive the information? What's the best method or channel of communicating that information? who's the best person to do it, and what's the best time to, to do those things. And I would think even if you consider those as principles and guidelines for your communication, whether it's working from home or when we get back to the office, whenever that may be, I would believe that your communication will greatly enhance and the impact of your communication will uh, be much better. I'd like to kick off by debunking a myth around communications, and that is that communications is merely data transmission. It's not. It's not the transmission of data. I would much rather you view it as the creation of understanding. And it is our jobs as communicators to create understanding in the recipients of the information that we're giving. And it's important to note that a thing said is not a thing understood, or not always a thing understood, and a thing said is not always a thing remembered. So our goal, again, as communicators, should be to create understanding, to be interesting, to be understandable, to be memorable, and to maintain the relationship. These are the goals that we should be going for and hunting for, and I'm going to walk you through some very simple, but perhaps not always easy, uh, principles and guidelines to go through. Ultimately, how you gauge the success of your communication is if you have identified what you're trying to achieve and then that you can objectively say that you achieved it. So, for instance, if you're trying to get people to buy into a proposition, did you, did you get that buy-in? Well, then you can look at it and go through. So that is one of the ways that you measure impact and success. Are your recipient or your colleagues feeling the way you wanted them to feel? Are they doing the things that you wanted them to do? Or are they buying into what it is that you're hoping to buy, they will buy into? I'd also like to debunk another myth, and that is the myth that a good communicator is always a good orator, or that a good orator is always a good communicator. That's not the case. A good orator is not always a good communicator, and a good communicator is not always a good orator. 
And to give you maybe a slightly unusual example, I would take Donald Trump, for instance, and say Donald Trump is objectively not a good orator, and many of you may say he is not a good person. But the argument can be made that he's an effective communicator. He understands his audience. He knows what they worry about. He knows how to scratch them where they itch. He says things in terms that they can understand. He uses illustrations that they can get. And he repeats it enough time. He also considers the channel of best communicating with them. Is it through Twitter? Is it through a rally, although he's not allowed to do them anymore uh, with COVID? Or is it through his press conferences? So although we may not agree with anything that he says, and in fact, a lot of it is untrue, some of how he approaches his communication actually applies a lot of the good principles. One of the things that uh, myself and my colleagues in the communications clinic would have observed through our work over the years, particularly with multinationals who have multiple sites uh, around the globe is that when they are communicating using the technology, whether that's video or, uh, or phone or email, that the deficits or deficiencies tend to get magnified and amplified. So things, for example, that we might, and I say might as the, as the, as the key word, we might have gotten away with in a room, in a, in a boardroom, really are not survivable now. If you are going to be working from home and say delivering a presentation, if you had a text heavy slide, if we take that as the example, you might have got away with that in the boardroom. I would argue you won't get away with that now over video, particularly using screens. So we can come to slides and discussing best use of technology like that. But slides in particular uh, are going to become something that you need to really reflect on if you happen to be presenting remotely because you suddenly become a tiny thing on the screen and the slide dominates it and they should be ultimately the other way around. You're the star of the show when you're delivering a presentation. So the things that we may have gotten away with are now not survivable. So when you're communicating, the things that I would think you should be thinking about are thinking about the other, the other person. Think about what you're trying to achieve, thinking about the best channel to communicate to them, the best time to communicate at, thinking about the significance of your communication and the relevance of that to them. I always find a good question to ask yourself in preparation is so what? We should all have an internal so what ticking in our heads to make sure that the content that we're going through is relevant to the people that we're talking to. And remember, and I'd ask you to remember this, and it's the iron law, or it's certainly what we refer to as the iron law of communications, is that people will engage and listen to you if you're threatening them, if you're benefiting them, or if you're being interesting to them. Now, I'm not suggesting any of us start threatening our colleagues or our family or our clients, but threaten or remove a threat, benefit or value, or we're interesting to them. So keep that in mind, because again, that keeps the so what-ometer focused and thinking about it, particularly where we're communicating remotely, it becomes all the more important. And all the more important then as well, whether it's working from home or we're back in the office, is considering the best channel to communicate our thoughts and our points and our information to our colleagues or to our customers. One of the great themes in the CCMA conferences that I have attended is the whole concept of multi-channel and having those different ways of communicating with our customers. I'd ask you to be certainly considering the best way of communicating with your colleagues. Email. Is an email the best way of communicating? Email, I think, is one of the most dangerous ways of communicating. Is a document the best way? Is a video call the best way? And you need to consider, I would argue, you need to consider what is the best channel for them to receive the information, not what's the best channel for you. We tend sometimes to choose the best channel for us to communicate something rather than for the recipient, whether it can be really quick to just ping off an email without actually considering the recipient and how they'll feel, or sometimes it's easier to deal with conflict, or it certainly feels easier to deal with conflict over email. So we ping them an email rather than having a time to consider a phone call and maybe approaching a, diff a different way. So emails, again, as an example, when we're working from home and you're trying to influence and communicate, are a dangerous tool where voice, face, more importantly, are they are the most effective ways. And I would be asking you to consider those channels to be effective if they are the best channel for your audience. And that's a consistent thing I would be encouraging you all to do, which is, again, something in the CCMA conferences we would have heard about. But it's that whole thing of flexing to the customer, but flexing to your audience and to the recipient. And we often know our colleagues or our family even 
we know what way our mum likes to be communicated. She prefers a phone call or our dad likes WhatsApp or we know what makes our brother cry and our sister laugh. We know what they're interested in. But it's worth considering that again for your colleague or your manager. What way do they prefer the information? Do they like detail? Do they just want the top line stuff? Do they like slides? Do they not? Do they need it in writing? Would they prefer it over the phone? These are all things I would encourage you if you want to be effective and highly effective communicators that you need to really think about. And it's possible whether it's one to one, one to few, one to many in a presentation. Like to give you an example of a presentation, I was working with a clinician uh, a couple of years ago where they were delivering to 5,000 people in Las Vegas on their research. And we profiled the audience. Majority of the people were female. They were from North America. They had 15 years uh, experience and they specialized in cardiology. But we boiled that audience actually down to one person. Because I think whether it's talking to somebody one-to-one -one or talking in a presentation, your audience should feel like you're talking just to them, talking to that person. And if you begin to, in your mind's eye, think of that audience, it actually allows you structure a presentation much better and structure your communication much better because it's all focused on that person. So there's some of the things even in relation to verbal communication and all communication, to consider the channel, to consider the audience, to consider where they're coming from. Because as a, when you're verbally communicating, whether it's like we're talking now over a webinar and a presentation, I would encourage you that your task is to be interesting, understandable, and memorable. Because if you're not interesting, they're not listening. If you're not understandable, they're not getting it. And if, that, if they're not remembering it, sure, what's the point? Because that memorability is a crucial piece. And one of the most famous writers on the whole concept of speaking and public speaking and oratory and rhetoric, Cicero, said the perfect uh, speaker had the perfect combination of three things. They had substance, they had technique, and they had passion. Now, I'm gonna leave the substance to you guys, and I'll get to the passion later on. But on the technique, the techniques around effectively verbally communicating are very simple. It's understanding the audience, it's having an objective, and it's asking yourself, what are you trying to achieve? But it is worth noting that at some point, and even maybe now on this webinar, some of you may not be paying attention. And your audiences may not always be paying attention. And particularly when we're working now remotely and we're listening to people via Zoom or via video or via Microsoft Teams, there are more opportunities for them not to pay attention. They could be on their phone, sitting at their desk. And Simon Cooper, a brilliant uh, columnist with the Financial Times, had a piece a couple of years ago who said, when you're beginning to talk to people, you have to assume that they're already bored. Now, I think that's a stark thing, but I think if we remember that when we're talking to people or emailing people or communicating with people, assuming that they're already bored means that you're setting out to be interesting early on. But even what Cooper said was, was kind of echoed in another book by a guy called Richard Saul Werman. And as an aside, Saul Werman is one of the people behind TED.com. And his book, Information Anxiety, is very interesting, where he talks about us all being under a thing called information anxiety. We were being bombarded with content continuously. And this can feel more stressful and more apparent now that we're working from home because we have family, we have emails, we have text messages, we have WhatsApps, we have instant messaging, we have phones, we have video messages. We're being bombarded with content continuously. And Worman argues we are under the thing of information anxiety. And he gave the comparison that we encounter more information in a daily newspaper than a medieval scholar would have encountered in a lifetime. Our ability to remember hasn't improved, but our capacity to disregard and disregard at source has. We essentially say, that's not of relevance to me. So he says there's a gateway point of around 30 seconds. So if we want to be effective communicators within our emails or within our calls or within our meetings or within our presentations, we need to be setting out to be interesting, but setting out to be interesting and relevant from the start getting to the point quickly and framing it in a way that our audience will receive it the way we want them to receive it and hear it the way we want them to hear it. But the only way we can do that is having considered the audience and what they care about. So again, it's that constant flexing of our content to them. A thing on presentation skills, and we can come to the questions and answers in, the, in a few minutes if you have them, but a thing around question, uh, presentation skills that I'd like you to consider is that pre in terms of how you structure them, I want you to forget if you ever knew it. I want you to forget the tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them model. That is an ineffective approach to approaching your presentations and it tends to be dull and boring. Agendas at the start of presentations tend to be boring because they don't have the so what in them. 
So the structure I'd like you to follow is as follows. Tell them why they should listen, tell them your stuff, and then tell them what you want them to remember. So again, remember, tell them why they should listen, incentivize them, hook them, tell them your stuff, and then tell them what you want them to remember. And that last thing on what you want them to remember is crucial. There is a concept in communication called primacy or proximity, or also known in a posh way as the serial position effect, which essentially says people remember the first thing that they hear and the last thing that they hear anyway. So if you are presenting, whether it's physically in the room or remotely, and in particular remotely, you should have a strong wrap up reiterating the key points that you want to make. We might get into this a little bit more in the Q&A, but it's also if you are trying to influence. And this is, again, I remember hearing it in last year's presentation around influencing upwards at the CCMA conference, where we need to have evidence that our audience will relate to, whether that's up the line or down the line, evidence that they can connect with that they see credible and see as credible. And again, that takes a little bit of preparation that we're saying, okay, well, I have a good idea here. Do I have the evidence of being able to present that? And that gets plugged in to your presentation. Storytelling is something that has been in vogue for the last five years. I would argue it has been in vogue for the last thousands of years. Uh, if you look, for example, at the Bible, and I won't start getting religious with you on a Friday morning, but if you look at the Bible, for example, and most religious texts, they use stories, anecdotes to illustrate concepts, whether that is love or forgiveness. For instance, the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son. All of those are illustrations and stories to prove a concept. We need to be able to tell stories and examples and provide evidence to prove the concepts that we are trying to do. And they become absolutely important remotely. It becomes absolutely important in our conversations and absolutely important in our presentations. Then you might start thinking about visual aids, but I won't, don't want you thinking about slides really at all. Now this might sound odd, um, but I think PowerPoint is one of the greatest uh, things to erode effective communication that has ever been created. Uh, PowerPoint slides are the devil, and they tend to be used because the presenter feels they need them. Whereas I would argue they have to be there to help the audience. So the slides aren't there for us, they are there for them, the audience that we are talking to. And you need to ask yourselves, am I using the technology because it's there, or am I using the technology because it adds value? And we have to use it because it adds value to the audience. So to give you just the research to back this up, Yale did a study called the Cognitive Style of PowerPoint a number of years ago, and it still is the main piece of research around PowerPoint. And it says that PowerPoint is three things. It's presenter friendly, it's audience distracting, and it erodes significance in the message. So the fact that it's presenter friendly, I don't care. I care about the second two. Is it distracting of the audience? Yes, it is, so therefore not good, and it erodes significance and understanding. So when you are preparing a presentation, particularly now when you're working from home or preparing a communication and you think you may need slides, the slides have to be there to help the person who's receiving the information, not to help you remember. And a good way of working off use of visual aids in any setting is just the simple thing of don't show them anything until you want them to look at it. Don't show them anything until you want them to look at it. Because particularly where they're viewing something just on the screen and you're a little square in the right corner, you've lost their eyeballs. So you want to manage where they're looking as much as possible. Obviously, then, in any communication, it's worth considering what's the likely reaction of the, the recipient. Are they going to agree with me? Are they going to disagree with me? What are the likely questions they're going to ask? What are the nasty questions they might ask? And then, obviously, figuring out the responses that you might want to make. All of what I've just talked about is the talk and bit around communication. I actually think the best communicators are the best listeners. Now, I don't think Donald Trump, in fairness, is a particularly good listener, uh, but the best communicators that I have encountered in my life uh, tend to be great listeners. And if you want to enhance your relationships and if you want to enhance your uh, communication in general, I would ask you to try and minimize the amount you talk by about 20, 30% and try it over the weekend and try and listen and increase your listening by 20 and 30% because listening is simply the greatest gift we can give to anybody, <clears throat> particularly when we're working remotely. People need that connection and we should be often going on calls, not to talk, but in fact to listen. And a brilliant book that I would recommend any of you get a chance to read is uh, The Trust Fire by a guy called Meister. 
where it was written originally for professional services firms, but I in fact think it's very relevant for all types of organizations with different uh, departments and everything. And it's actually great for relationships, but within it he says we should get into the habit of listening for what's different, not for what's familiar. So that the tendency is we just listen for what's familiar and we latch onto that, rather than listening for what's different, which might be a little difficult to get into where we're not familiar with something or somebody said something that we hadn't heard them say before, and we should actually go to that and play with that and listen to that and ask more questions about that rather than listening for what's familiar. He also says, and this, is, this crops up in the seven habits as well, but he talks about the importance of listening to understand rather than listening to talk and listening to win. And again, boring people uh, tend to listen to talk. So really I'm not listening to you, I'm just waiting for the gap to say my bit. And then competitive pe people, which I think unfortunately I fall into sometimes listen to win, where I listen to you to beat you in your argument rather than necessarily listening to you to understand you. So listening is a skill that we, people don't really know you're doing. Um, and it's something that we should actively try and do because it is simply the greatest gift that we can do for people. So one of the things I would always advise people when they're delivering any sort of presentation is to flag your conclusion. So I'm going to flag mine because I'm coming down to land now. But in relation to communication, I think really it is understanding and having appreciation of the other. It's not about us, it's about them. That's applicable, particularly where we're working from home, where we're considering, okay, well, what is the best way I need to communicate with this person? But more importantly, what's the best way for them to receive it? Would an email work? Would a call work? Would a video work? Am I using illustrations and evidence that would persuade them? And am I using language that they'll get? And remember, if you can listen to people, if you can learn people, it will greatly enhance your communication. So I hope there was something of use there. If you have any questions, obviously we can get, get into it now. And if there's anything that you'd like to ask me privately, feel free to drop me a mail. It's own E-O-G-H-A-N at cclinic.ie or alternatively, uh, just reach out to me on LinkedIn and I'd be delighted to uh, have a chat. So that's the input. I don't know if there's any questions there or if you have any questions for me. Yeah, we had a question that came in before today from Julia and I know she's online, so I'll just give it, give it to you now. Uh, what are success measurements in relation to communication skills? What are success measurements that prove your communication skills when working from home are effective? I would view it, um, Dorothy, as that objective-based activity that you can't, I suppose it's in like any, any project or any action, you don't know it has worked out if you haven't decided what worked out is. And if, for example, you want to ensure that people understand it, well, how are you, you know, are you going to have a discussion with people to say, look, have you got what I've just said? Would you be able to give it back to me what you think you've heard or what you've heard? or if you're trying to get people to buy into an initiative or a proposal that you're making, if we are simply seeing that, and that is the action that we're going into, then you know you are being effective. So some of the most effective communicators I have seen are the people who get things done. They may not be very fluent, they may not be particularly charismatic, but fluency and charisma aren't necessities to effective communication. It's understanding and having an appreciation of the other and being able to frame things in that way that they see it of value or of interest or of benefit to them. So I, I would view that, Dorothy, as if you have set out what you want to achieve, whether it is increasing understanding, motivating people, or it is getting buy-in. If you have established that as, a, as an objective and then you are able to either check back in or to see it in action, that's the way that you can get uh, a sense that you have been effective. Okay, and a second question then from Ashling: Is there a good way to bring someone back when you can see you've lost their attention? And that's obviously very clearly in this, in this type of environment. How do you do that? Yeah, well, I think in particular in the, this nature of a, of a piece where A, you may not be able to see them uh, like you could in a, in, a, in a room. That is something that I probably broke the room myself. I think I probably went for about 15, 20 minutes there. Like even in the, physically in the room, an audience find it very difficult to stay with a speaker unless they are an absolute genius for longer than 20 minutes. From our experience of working with organizations where they're communicating remotely, inputs have to be far, 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 far shorter than they would normally be in the room. So even that's the first thing that we ourselves need to be more conscious of, is that our inputs have to be shorter because people, their capacity to stay focused on the screen is much less than their capacity to stay focused on the human being in the room. 
So, you know that line, I think it's Blaise Pascal who had the line, apologies for the length of my letter, I didn't have time to write you a short one. I think there's a bit of that with, with communication. It should be apologies for the length of my communication, I didn't have time to, to condense this down. We should be trying to condense down our communications all the time, but particularly doing it remotely because of people's attention spans are far less. Now to answer the question after that long and rambling input, but I think on that one, if you are the chair or if you are the input or if you want people to engage with your presentation or your input, the thing that I have found is a sure fast way of doing it is calling people out. I mean that in a positive way, but if we want, for example, Dorothy, you to engage, I would be saying, Dorothy, can I get your thoughts on that and throw it to you? Rather than uh, the closed question of, Dorothy, do you have any questions on that? Which will invariably lead you to say, no, no, I'm fine on that. Or Dorothy, is everything okay with you? You'll invariably go, no, it's okay, I'm okay. Whereas what I would be suggesting is you actually throw the question, sorry, Dorothy, can you give us your thoughts on that or what inputs you would make? But that in the remote nature where you're doing it over phone or over video is the way to do it. Because what we, again, with one of the financial institutions we've been working with over the last couple of weeks in particular, what they have found is when they're chairing meetings and they hop it out to their, their team and say, has anybody got any thoughts on that? What they get back is silence. Because either people might be putting on the wash or they've disengaged or they're on their phone or they simply just don't want to say the thing over the over video. So what you have to do, which you mightn't have to do because of your gaze path or how you might look in the room, what you have to do is call people out and drag them in. And presumably and once you do that once or twice in the environment of, of meetings, like of having a meeting in this sort of platform, and obviously not the same person all the time, then people know they have to keep their attention. They know that the potential they could be asked. So I presume it would keep people on their toes. Oh, absolutely. That's, and, and that's totally it. And there's a couple of things on that, Dorothy, particularly where you're chair, chairing a meeting remotely, that the chair has to be authoritative, but also should set the behaviours and expectations at the start of the meeting. So whether that is, look, guys, I'm going to be calling on you individually for your contributions because I want to get everybody to contribute. And also, if you guys, you'll have to forgive me if you're being a little long winded or if you're going off, I'm going to interrupt you because I want to keep the show on the road. So the chair should be establishing that. But also then, if, for example, the calling out of people by name, it absolutely starts changing people's behavior because everybody starts learning it and go, oh, Christ, I don't want to be publicly embarrassed by clearly being disengaged in this. So it achieves that um, in a slightly negative way, but it achieves the better behavior from it because people are subtly being trained to start behaving the way that you would want them to behave. Great, thanks. So now another question, and I didn't catch it either. I was going to ask you the book you mentioned, Trust in the title. We didn't catch the end of the, the full title of that book. Anthony has asked for that. So do you have the will you repeat the title of that book? Of course. It's called The Trusted Advisor. The Trusted Advisor and the and author. By a, guy, a guy called uh David Meister, I think, but Meister is certainly his surname his surname. M-A-I-S-T-E-R. And then Anthony's second question, are there courses for those who want to perfect their virtual communication skills? Oh, absolutely. You can get onto the Communication <laughs> Clinic's website. Um, <laughs> and mention no. CCMA, you better get a bit, big discount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not at all. No, but there are, Anthony. And uh, But I would view, Anthony, the, the, um, the rules of effectively communicating remotely or over video. Um, in or in the remote workplace, which we are all going to have to find ourselves in now, are essentially good and effective communication skills on steroids. So, for example, where we want to have impact in a meeting, particularly in a remote meeting, we have to prepare really well. Now, I would argue we should be preparing for meetings really effectively anyway, but we have to do it all the more. We really have to be conscious of how we're going to make our inputs. Are they tight? Are they focused? Are they evidenced? I would argue that should have been done anyway, but it's particularly more important. How we chair a meeting, we have to be really conscious that we can drag people in, get contributions that we probably should have been doing when we were in the room, become all the more important now because people have a chance to hide or disengage or stop listening or simply not contribute. So all of the good behaviors we should have been seeing should be done it now in the remote setting because that is something that we're all getting more used to and coming through on. So that is something that I would think if we were, if, if you were to look and say, well, actually, am I a good communicator outside of this? Yeah, I am. Well, you just have to, again, keep applying the good behaviors, but you have to do them all the more, more um, consciously. Great. Uh, another question. Ashling, Zoom meetings, 15 people, how do you avoid interrupting each other? 
there's a few things to that. I would suggest that everybody is put on mute at the start of the meeting. Um, so that backs out all background noise. I would suggest as well that the chair establishes good behaviours at the start so that is again instructing people, certainly asking people to make their contributions short and focused and single single points. One of the difficulties people have is they make multi-clausal points and they go on for ages and then it's lost. So the chair should again be encouraging people to make single points in their, in their inputs. Then to stop uh, people interrupting, that's difficult, but again, you would suggest that the chair should be establishing that at the start. And then when you have to do make an interruption, I would have a, I have to remember how many elements are. I think there's a three or four element thing. The chair's name, your name, and then your bridge. So Dorothy, it's Owen here. Can I build on something Ashley has said? Yada, yada, yada. It's something that we would use for our clients when they're going on radio and they're doing, uh, they're being the contributor from outside of uh, the studio. That that is the model that they would use. So chair's name, your name, and then your bridge. So can I just add on something that Ashley has said there, or can, can I come in on that? And that's where the chair should be the facilitator and the architect of a good meeting, rather than a passive observer who lets a bun fight happen. And if a, a whole load of interruptions are happening, um, the chair needs to call a halt to it and say, look guys, this is not being an effective thing. Can we just have one speaker at a time? So again, where we might have had a loose enough chair in physical meetings, i.e. the ones in the office or in the room, we do need to have a pretty authoritative chair directing and facilitating the conversation. Great, I'm conscious of the time on. So in terms of people coming back to you for further advice, a lot of people have asked for the recommendation of that book. So we've given that. I don't know if there was another book you mentioned. Was there another book you mentioned? Or was that it? Um, I was listening, I promise. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I think you might have messaged another book. You hadn't gone to put the washing on, Dorothy, no? No, no, no. no. Uh, Information uh, Anxiety was the other book that I had mentioned by Richard Saul Werman. And also, uh, the cognitive style of PowerPoint is an interesting uh, piece of research to look at. And also, um, there are good books written by the guys involved in TED, where, again, people who talk about TED speakers, they, they often say TED speakers are great. And I have to admit, TED speakers, the people that TED.com or the TED guys tend to choose are pretty good communicators. But also, it has to be noted, Ted, Ted set out a whole load of rules that people have to follow. You don't use a huge amount of slides. You keep the language pretty simple. You tell stories. You don't overload your audience with too much information. You have to stand and deliver it. They're all good behaviors that suddenly people go, oh, it's on TED.com. They're brilliant speakers. They are simple things that we should all be following in, when we're delivering a presentation, but they are all the more important when we're doing it remotely. Okay, uh, well, I might ask you a favour. Would you mind putting all those books with the authors in an email if you get time? And then Natasha, I, I think the Seamus, Anthony, anybody that was on the call that wants those, um, I'll pass them on to them if that's okay with you, or they can connect with you via LinkedIn, as you say. Uh, so thank you so much. I think that the number of questions shows you the interest in this topic. So we might come back to you again, depending how long we're all working from home for the rest of the year. Uh, uh, but really appreciate that, Owen. Thank you so much for your your contribution. So applause here from uh, from, from 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 CCMA. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just to do my normal housekeeping bits and pieces, um, our next webinar is on Tuesday, sorry I have to find my notes, about me a second, uh, which is on supporting an environment or culture of coaching uh, and working from home. So that's going to take place uh, on Tuesday morning with Cormac Murphy and next Friday we have Michael Nolan who's a CX expert uh, who was previously with Car Trawler uh, and he is going to be um, uh, launching uh, or speaking in our Ask the Expert uh, series. So big shoes to fill after you today, Owen. And I just got a lovely uh, message there from Anthony saying, thanks, Owen, great, great presentation, fantastic. So well done to you. And um, two other things I want to mention is that we have a blog going out that uh, Neve is just showing there uh, that will actually have a link to all of our previous webinars. So as I said, we record all of these webinars. So anybody who hasn't been on before, We'll have a blog on our homepage, hopefully later today, where you'll be able to access all the previous. I think the last count, we've done over 20 webinars at this stage. And then the last thing I want to mention, um, we want to do a survey of members um, to look at how people are planning to reopen their contact centres. Uh, and we're doing a bit of work on that at the moment. But what we'd like to ask anybody in the audience, in the audience today is if there's a question that you have from your organisation in terms of 
companies going back to work, how they're approaching it, where, what, what way they're doing it, how they're working from home and working in the office is going to work. Please send it through to me and we'd be happy to include it in the survey. And we're hoping to get that survey out to everybody next week. And I think it'll just provide some useful, valuable benchmarking data uh, to share with all of you on what companies are planning to do. And I'm just seeing a flashing light of one more question. I might have missed it there. Um, I think oh, no, just, I think I have them. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Great. Well, listen, Owen, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. I know we won't be seeing you next week, unfortunately, but we will see you soon when uh, things are back on track. But thanks as always for your contribution. Really enjoyed that this morning. So thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Take care. Thanks, guys. Bye. 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 -bye.